You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. Simon Seabag Montefiore is a British historian. He's 57, lives in London with his novelist wife Santa and their two children. He's written 12 books, 9 nonfiction, and 3 novels. His latest effort is called The World, A Family History of Humanity. Including the index, it's 1,304 pages. In his preference, historian Montefiore writes, I have always wanted to write an intimate human history like the world. In some ways, a new approach. In some ways, a traditional one, which is the fruit of a lifetime of study and travels. Simon Seabag Montefiore, it's presidential season once again in the United States. And just a couple of days ago, Mike Pence made this statement. And it, we're not picking on Mike Pence because they all do this. And I want to get your reaction in, in history about uh, what this all means. The American people are the most freedom-loving, faith-filled, idealistic, generous people the world has ever known. The American people have always been great. We just need government as good as our people. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And I believe with all my heart, God is not done with America yet. And if we turn our hearts back to the author and finisher of our faith and freedom, freedom story, the American story, has only just begun. And the best days of the greatest nation on earth are yet to come. What's it like when you who are you're not an American here were the greatest nation in the history of the world? Well, in some ways that's true. And I can say that as an Englishman. But um but also one should say when you when you look at world history, I've just written a world history, um virtually every nation has a culture, a tradition of exception of exceptionalism. It's not just America. Um another part of that is the special linkage with the promised land, um, Israel, Jerusalem, city on a hill, um, which, which, you know, comes from British history. And again, um, the religiosity of, of American life, you know, reflects a part of human nature as well. You know, um, we, we need religiosity in our, in our lives and even in secular cultures, um, like Britain, like much of America. Or the other half of America, I should perhaps say, um, you know, there are also orthodoxies and saints. So, you know, Pence's speech reflects many, many um, strains of that are universal to American, to uh, to world, to world culture, and to human culture, and to political culture. But of course, it's a fascinating moment, isn't it, um, in American history at the moment? But after you've done this book on world history. Uh, how do we fit in? I mean, you know, we we hear this from our politicians all the time. W- could you name the greatest country in history? Well, you know, I'm kind of um, I, I, I'm a British historian, but I I regard America as the most extraordinary um, nation in human history so far. Um, it's the only it's the only state, I suppose apart from perhaps the Soviet Union, you could claim. But, I mean, the Soviet Union um, would, is just another manifestation of Russia in many ways. But America's really the only nation created on an idea. And that idea was um, a republic, a democracy with checks and balances, which is an extraordinary thing. 
And with all we know about the flaws of American democracy and freedom, and boy, there are a lot of them. Um, you know, American democracy was created when half, when half, when 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 you know millions of people were were in servitude, were slaves. Um, and you know, full American democracy, we need to remind ourselves, did not arrive until 1965. Until then, there was apartheid with the with with the Jim Crow laws and so on. But nonetheless. It's an extraordinary achievement, America. And, you know, another interesting thing, you know, if you look at the world today, um, virtually every country in the world, except the constitutional monarchies, and a few countries that have emulated the British prime ministerial system, virtually every country, even Russia and China, follow um, the American example of a presidency, um, a legislature, elections. I mean, many of them are cosplay democracies. But... You know, virtually all the states created since 1945, in one way or another, follow an American template. And that in itself is an extraordinary achievement. You name a lot of people in your book, obviously. I want to ask you about Putin. Where does he fit? Putin is a fascinating character. Um, Putin um, fits right into Russian history and in a way that is... Um, absolutely extraordinary to a historian of Russia, as, as, as I've written a lot of Russian history, as you know. We've been talking about Russian history together since about 2004, Brian. Um, but, you know, he he channels both the Tsars, the, the, the Romanov Tsars, and, and particularly Stalin. I mean, of course, he cherry-picks from Russian history. His, his heroes are the successful rulers. Um, you know, in the 20th century, for all the appalling costs of his rule and his achievements, Stalin was the most successful Russian ruler of the century by far. Um, and before that, um, you know, Putin, Putin really wants to emulate three great, three or four great rulers. Nicholas the first is one, uh, perhaps Alexander the first, certainly um, Peter the Great, and certainly Catherine the Great and Prince Potemkin. Who were the who were the root two rulers in the 18th century, uh, the two sets of rulers, perhaps I should say, who who conquered Ukraine and conquered Crimea, Catherine and Potemkin annexed Crimea, annexed South Ukraine, and built all the cities that we are now hearing about as we listen to the news of the Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive, which is happening right now as we're talking, Brian. You know, many of those many of those cities were founded by Prince Potemkin, Sebastopol, Kherson, Mariupol, and so on. Um, so Putin very much looks back to this, and this is an imperialist war. Now, I mean, there's a huge industry in academia, in America and England particularly, of professors studying empire and, how, and, the, and, the, and the many, many crimes of empire. But they sort of didn't notice there was an empire right in front of them today in 2022, 2023, and that was Russia. And Putin has always felt that Russia was not a complete state without Ukraine as part of it. And um, I suppose the British equivalent would be perhaps Ireland, perhaps Wales, perhaps Scotland, I don't know. But one has to think of it something like that from the Russian point of view. And uh, I think from my own personal knowledge of him, I've never met him, but from my own personal knowledge of him, you know, he's been thinking about this since he came to power. Um, when I published my first book in 2000, Catherine the Great and Potemkin, the story of that partnership, and I think we've talked about that before. Um, you know, when, he, when, he, when I published that, he read it, and, um, and his people asked me about, you know, they said that he was particularly interested in the conquest of South Ukraine and Crimea. And that was 23 years ago. I want you to put this into context. Not very far from here is something called the Spy Museum. And in the Spy Museum, on the wall, is the ice axe that killed Trotsky. What should we know about the ice axe? And I don't know how it got there, but it's one of the more fascinating things in the Spy Museum. Well, I love I love all spy museums. I haven't actually been to that spy museum, but I'm I'm obsessed with espionage, and you know it's a great 
tradition of modern Russian rulers. Um, they didn't really do this under the Romanovs, by the way. But since, um, since 1917, since the, the Bolshevik Revolution, it's been a tradition um, that you wipe out your enemies and just and liquidate them personally. Partly that was ideological. Partly it was emulation of the French terror, which they all studied and, and revered, by the way. And partly it was of a fascinating thing, but fascinating phenomenon that is totally relevant to understanding Vladimir Putin now, which is when they created the Cheka, the, the first secret police that became later the NKVD, the KGB, the FSB, right up till today, um, they borrowed, they recruited, men, they commandeered many of the traditions and many of the personnel of organized crime and mafia. Um, Russia has always been a country of organized, organized criminals, um, starting as thieves in power, an old-fashioned brotherhood of, of criminals, but, but obviously developing. And, um, and they, they recruited those people. Stalin himself had um, been the, the, the chief fundraiser and chief protection racketeer to raise money uh, for the Communist Party, for Lenin, for Lenin's professional revolutionaries. And he was someone who understood that you wanted to commandeer this culture and put it at the service of the Communist Party and the Soviet Union. And so they did that. And so part of it has always been basically assassinating, whacking in the mafia, in mafia terminology, um, enemies. And Stalin made the mistake in 1929 of letting his arch enemy, Leon Trotsky, out of the Soviet Union, thinking that that would disarm him. But in fact, Trotsky launched a campaign that lasted for 11 years to undermine and smear Stalin on every, on every opportunity, at every opportunity. Stalin um, therefore framed Trotsky as his ultimate uh, Mephistophelian satanic enemy behind every conspiracy against him. And he also ordered um, teams of assassins to find him and kill him. And they had several attempts. And the last attempt was when he was in Mexico City, when Rama Mathada, forgive my Spanish accent, which is non-existent, but was recruited um, as an NKVD spy um, befriended Trotsky, became trusted by Trotsky, and then um, crept up behind him with that ice pick and um, smashed his skull in. Um, Trotsky died hours or days later, and Stalin was, was celebrated and promoted Sudoplatov and the other um, operatives in the NKVD who had pulled off this coup. So that was just one example of the many, many um, defectors and enemies who were assassinated on Stalin's orders and later under Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. And um, that's a tradition that with a short gap uh, for, for the Yeltsin years, Putin has re-embraced again. I should say Putin's the only ruler, the only Russian leader to come directly from the security forces, to be a, a Czechist, to be um, a, a sort of spy. And Lavrenti Beria in 1953 hoped to succeed Stalin. He came from a similar background, but he was distrusted and, and uh, Khrushchev, backed by the military, Marshal Zhukov, the great hero of World War II, um, launched a coup against him, arrested him and then executed him. But Putin, so Putin is an unusual character. Are you sitting in the room in London that you wrote the book? I am, yeah. What you, you point out it, that you wrote this during COVID and that your wife and children were off in the country. What impact in exile. in exile? What impact did the COVID thing besides you writing this book have on you, the family? And uh, is there any residual from all that? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, it, 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 in a very basic way, I mean, I could never have written this book. Um, this is the hardest thing I've ever written. It's the most challenging. It's the thing I'm most proud of. It's the most satisfactory and the most daunting. Um, it's an insane project, to be frank. Brian, and you've read all my books, and they're all they're all they're all you know deep studies of human nature in different ways. But this was the craziest, um, and I wasn't sure I could do it. But it was it was really enabled, and I was empowered by COVID. I was locked in this room um, for two and a half years. 
And I lived like a mafia boss going to the mattresses, as they say in The Godfather. I, you know, I woke up at sort of five in the morning. I wrote until I was exhausted at about two. I was on my own. My family and my dog were in the country. Uh, my wife, very sweetly, who's also a writer, Santa, gave me the opportunity not to, not not to sort of really be part of the family for about two years, and I wrote in here every day, and gradually I I, I, I wrote the book um, very intensely. I woke at sort of dawn every morning or in the middle of the night, worrying I'd left out somebody, and so that was part of it. But the other great thing about living in a world crisis is you realize that world history and the world of family history of humanity is in some ways the ultimate world history, I, I hope. Um, great thing about writing is it, it is a tonic for troubled times. It gives perspective. Another part of it is, you know, we were obsessed with disease, with pandemics, epidemics, medicine, medical solutions, um, technological advances during that time, weren't we? And so this book is filled with those things. I mean, my father was a doctor. Uh, my uncle was a doctor. I came from, a, I come from partly a medical family. And so this book is filled with medicine, with technology, and of course, with pandemics, the, the Black Death, the Justinian plague, the, the, the Antonine plague, um, and all of the, the bubonic plague in different, in different forms and different moments. Um, all of this is hugely important because plagues, uh, pandemics are what I call super propellants of history. They and wars and violence and natural disasters, those are the super propellant crises that change history inc with incredible speed. And there's that great, I, I really um, subscribe to that great Lenin quote, you know, um, nothing happens for decades. And then, you know, year, decades happen in weeks. One of the Go to a part, I, I've watched you and your trips around the world talk about your book, and I've never been able to, I've never seen this particular thing, so I'm going to try it with you and see how it works. The music, the music chart, the number, yeah. uh, and you list them, and I'm going to just sh play a little excerpt from them. I know you're on your website. You can go there and see these and get about a minute of, of each of these tunes, and you can then buy them through Spotify. Um, the first one, first of all, why did you do this? Why did you do them? The, and what, what does that fit into the, the, your history book? Well, first of all, you know, just as the very most basic part of this book is, you know, the world, a family history of humanity. I, the reason why, one of the reasons why I chose family, the broadest reason is I wanted the span of world history with the intimacy, the juice of, of biography. But I also wanted to catch the continuity of human life, which is very hard to catch in histories, which tend to dwell on the rise and fall of empire battles and the sort of eureka moments of technological or medical discoveries. Um, I wanted to get the feeling of what people ate, what people wore, what houses they lived in, and what music they listened to. Music was part of that. So that's part of, and it fits very well into the family history idea that I've, that I've, um, that I've written here. But also, um, you know, when I was writing the book in this room, I listen to music very loudly, which is unusual for writers, especially for writers desperately trying to master many, many subjects. But I, I like the velocity it gives you when you're writing. And so I and then I started to listen to songs that suited the period. So I listened to, you know, Katusha from the from when I was writing about the Soviet Union in World War II. Um, I listened to uh, winds of change when I was writing about the fall of, of the Berlin Wall, for example, in 89, 91, and so on. And so I, and then I, I thought, oh my God, a history book. A history book has never had a playlist before, a soundtrack. And so I defined history songs, uh, that would go into this soundtrack for the world as, which, are, which is on Spotify, by the way. Um, and I define them as either songs that sing about history, like, Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones, for example, of which there are, there are many other examples, or songs that, like like the Winds of Change, for example, became the songs of a revolution. And I love the I love Barai, for example, which is the, the the anthem of the Iranian protests and demonstrations now in Iran. So I love that. But I just before just before you come back, I just wanted to say 
But there's another point, which is that especially in the 20th century, um, after 1945, um, pop singers, rock singers um, became figures who um, were at the very, very top of a new apex of society. There was no one higher socially after 1945. Um, you know, earls and kings didn't matter so much. But what mattered were people who were at the top of the, that, that sort of that vortex of commerce, politics, um, culture, a popular culture. And so that started with Frank Sinatra. And Frank Sinatra is a big character in the book because, you know, he invented popular culture with the Bobby Soxers, really. Um, he sung for the mafia in Havana in 1946 to Lucky Luciano and Maya Lansky. Um, he was friends with Jack Kennedy, he introduced the Kennedys to Marilyn Monroe, which, as we know, didn't go too well. Um, he introduced them to Judah Bexner and Sam Giancana, the mafia boss. And then he became friends with Ronald Reagan. So they're, 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 they're in a sort of one career is the reason why uh, music is important in this book. Here's a little bit of Frank Sinatra, which is listed as the 152nd book on your list. Not spreading the news. You're leaving today. Tell him, Frank. I want to be a part of it. New York, New York. Your vagabond shoes. They are longing to stray and step around the heart of it. New York, New York. Of course, Tony Bennett's there with this particular version, but talk more about Brilliant. Frank Sinatra and, and why his music matters. Well, you know, I mean, it, it matters so much because, like Elvis, he was one of those people who personified an era. And there is that kind of golden spot, isn't there? Like a Venn diagram of society where certain people um, crossed all the lines and combined and combined many different worlds. And there are a few people who do that, and many of them are, are in the book. And Sinatra's one. But his kind of unique combination of political influence and political connections and mafia connections, and of course, several different careers, um, one as a sort of pop singer in the late 40s, one as, a, one as a film star in the 50s and early 60s, and then another career as, as a great singer. Um, he's just unique. But, you know, Elvis Presley, one of the things I've just been on book tour around America, and I went on pilgrimage to Graceland. And of course, Elvis is part of this story. Um, again, you know, Elvis is fascinating because he co-opted and commandeered, some would say stole, African-American music. Um, and in Memphis, and I was in, I was loved being in Memphis. And but there are a few other people, you know, obviously the Beatles, Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones, um, Bowie, David Bowie, I think, is a big example. You know, and it's an interesting thing. I mean, I find, I personally am, have always been somewhat of a skeptic about all that Jackson Pollock and all those art, those artists in the 50s and 60s. And I've always thought that, you know, the real front line where the real genius in art was going on at that time was in rock and roll, in music. And when you look at the poetry of someone like Bob Dylan, um, Stones and Beatles, and particularly those kind of very arty um, singers like David Bowie, for example, and there are others, of course, um, you know, that's where, the, that's where the best work was being done. And they themselves merged together, you know, film, culture, um, poetry, and, and commerce and capitalism. Why is your book published in... Great Britain, like last year, and then here in the United States this year. What's the thought there? And in addition to that, where did you go when you came to the United States on tour? Um, the, I, I don't understand the reason for it. I think it's just um, it, the the, um, the mysterious wisdom of uh, of Knopf and Random House. But I'm very happy with it. It's coming out. I mean, it's coming out in all sorts of places. I would like to come out at the same time, but it's coming out. Um, 
it's, it's, it's been out in Spain, which is great because I have a lot of readers in South America. Um, it's, it's been out in India, which is great. I have a lot of readers there. Um, and, and next it's coming out in Germany and, and Brazil and, um, and Serbia and all sorts of other interesting places. I'm probably going to West Africa and there's a lot of Africa in this book too. In their, in their language? Because I saw somewhere no. where your books have been translated as many as 48 different languages? They have been. And some are tiny languages. I mean, you know, I, I count sort of Georgian and Azeri um, in the Caucasus, for example, Lithuania, Estonia. You can see how they add up. But it's, it's definitely in all, the, in all the big languages. I mean, the most surprising is China, really. Because um, Jerusal- my Jerusalem book, for mysterious reasons sold over a million copies in China alone, which is very bizarre. But anyway, I went on, on my tour in America. I was in uh, Boston, New York, D.C. Um, I visited the White House. So I was like very lucky. I went to the White House in Graceland. So really, what more do you need? Anyway, then I went down to the south, um, Memphis, and um, where I visited the Lorraine Motel as well. Um, where Martin Luther King was assassinated, and um, Miami, and Portland, and Seattle, and L.A. And one of my favorite places was going to Oxford, Mississippi, where I went on another pilgrimage to William Faulkner's tomb, to his grave, at midnight, um, where I put some pennies on his tomb and um, had a bourbon, as you do, apparently. And visited Roanoke. Anyway, here's, I heard you say this was your number one song in some category. These are the greatest songs about history. A little bit of Rolling Stone's Sympathy for the Devil, and I'll ask you why. Stuck around St. Petersburg When I saw it was a time for a change Killed the saw and its ministers So why? Why is that so high on your list? That, that's number one. First of all, because um, the Rolling Stones themselves are hugely important in just a sort of a cultural, cultural, political, um, capitalistic vortex that we're talking about of modern times, 60s and 70s particularly. Um, and, um, but secondly, because, because the words are so clever. And though there are many great history songs, and there are many great American history songs in the list too, you know, from the, the night they drove Old Dixie down to the Battle of New Orleans, you name it, um, to Strange Fruit and many other songs. But the point is, with this song is, first of all, it's got a novelistic um, uh, trope in it where the singer is actually the devil himself. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Who could this be? Um, there's a sort of almost Bar- Bulgarkovian uh, Master of Margarita touch to it, where Jagger, who was often com- you know, compared to the devil um, in the late 60s and early 70s after Altmont and other, dis- other disasters and scandals, um, he, he, um, you know, he compares himself, he compares himself to the devil. He narrates the 20th century um, from the point of view of the devil himself. And he looks at all the most terrible events of the 20th century. And all of them, of course, I've written about in this book, The World of Family History. And, you know, I drove a tank, held a general's rank when the blitzkrieg raged and the bodies stank. Brilliant lyrics, you know, right on that. I was there when they killed the, you know, killed the Tsar and all his ministers, for example. So, you know, this is a book that's right on the money on, on 20th century history and all its horrors. So for the, all these reasons, it's a very, very literary song, isn't it? And, um, and Mick Jagger himself, who I'm lucky enough to have, have, have met a few times, who wanted to make a film of Stalin, the court of the Red Tsar at one point. Um, so we had meetings with him. And, um, but he loves history and he's obsessed, with, he's obsessed with history. And you can tell that from the song. So like all these really top 
kind of rock stars. I, I, I don't know Bob Dylan. I'd love to know him. But like Bob Dylan, Elton John, Mick Jagger, they're all super clever. Bowie, I, I never met David Bowie. I'd love to have met him. One of the great regrets of my life. But all these people are sort of super intelligent um, people and interested in everything. And so he's, a, he's one of the great conversationists as well as, as, well as writing this. When I heard, heard you talk about the music list, you had 219 songs on there. And lately I see you've got over 400. How is that working? And how many did you start with? I think I started with about 100. And, you know, um, there are so many great ones about history. I mean, like Enola Gay, for example, about the nuclear bomb. Um, no More Heroes about Trotsky being assassinated. He got a he got an ice pick that made his ears burn in the words of the song. Um, there are all sorts of um, amazing um, songs in there. And as I said, you know, about 100 of them are American. So, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of Americana to celebrate. And I love Americana, as you know, hence my trip. And by the way, I'm coming back in November and I'm going to five literary festivals around America, which will be very exciting. But anyway, um, I invited people to look at the playlist on Spotify and to suggest songs that I'd miss. And so on Twitter um, and on all, you know, Facebook and all the, um, the, the digital media, um, they, people write and tell me and, say, and they, they love to criticize uh, my choices and say, why didn't you put this or why didn't you put that? Which I thoroughly enjoy. So I, I'll ask your, your viewers, Brian, please write to me somewhere, look at the playlist and um, tell me what I've missed out. And if you've got a great idea, I'll put it on there immediately. But I also invited people from foreign countries. And so I've had Iranians write to me from Iran um, who are protesting in the streets who asked me to put these. I've had Ukrainians, I've had Indians, I've had Spanish, all of whom have asked me to add things to the list. And I, and I, of course, I listen to the songs first because I don't want, I don't want rubbish on there. Um, it has to be a good song. It can't just be about history, but, um, it has to be good as well. But, you know, I've gradually, I've added to it. So it's doubled in size, but I, I, I like to think that, you know, from, from Abba's Waterloo to Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. I like to think that there's, the music is pretty good on there, and I, I, I hope it is. Here's one that I think you said is are the best lyrics, and it uh, it ends up at number 56 on the list. It's Coolio's Gangsta Paradise, at, and then you can tell us why. But a heartbeat away, I'm living life to a die. What can I say? I'm 23, never will I live to see 24 the way things are going. I don't know. Tell me, why are we so blind to see that the ones we heard are you and me? What's your thought on Gangsta's Paradise? This is, um, this is poetry equal to the great poets, I believe. And um, Cuyo's just, you know, the words are astonishing. The, the, um, the rhythm, the rhymes, and the sort of the poetry of, of the visions and the imagery. And the reason why I've got it on here is because, you know, urban life, um, especially sort of gang life in, in, the, in the great American cities in the late part of the 20th century and early 21st century um, are part of this story and part of the, you know, any world history um, because America is such an important part of this. And that song is the best expression of that, the best description of um, the desperate side of gang life, poverty um, uh, and, and inequality in in american cities and in the inner cities particularly among african americans in the 20, 20 late 20th and 21st century how were you introduced to coolio um <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know i mean i listen to all sorts of music as you'll see from this playlist and i just love this but the, but you know there's a lot of there's a lot of rap music in this um there's a lot of 
Um, there's a lot of soul in this. And then, of course, as I said, you know, you'll find songs from South America, from Spain, from from India too. And um, but this, these are one, these are from the original. That's one of the original choices when I had the first sort of hundred that I chose myself. And of course, now I've got four hundred and something. But you know, the playlist, the world playlist, um, it's a really important part of this. I don't think a history book's ever had a playlist before, but I think. I think it should have and they all should have i mean one of the great songs by the way is of course from hamilton as it rightly should be and um you know in the room where it happens is literally the best description of politics and, and decision making and negotiation and the smoke-filled room it's the best song about that in all of music and so of course that's the song that's in the that's in the um, playlist Here's Nina Simone from 1964, Mississippi Goddamn. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. Everybody knows about Mississippi Goddamn. Alabama's got me so upset. Lurleen Wallace has made me lose my rest. Everybody knows about Thanks for including that. I've never heard that song. Um, what got your attention there? Nina Simone is one of the giants in the book, um, in the playlist, rather. And she, um, she, she sings many songs that are um, very relevant to a, to, a, to a world playlist, and especially of, of American history, especially the South, especially um, uh, the, the civil rights movement and the struggle in the, in the 50s and early 60s. And um, this is just one of those, um, you know, the, the, you know, a big part of this book um, is to show a different side of, of, of American life. And I mean, to, you know, just to, to, to expand slightly, you know, one of the things when I started this book was, you know, take families, treat, um, treat all families the same wherever they came from and use family to expand you know the normal um, limits of, of world history and that that um, first of all there was a resolution not just to have families that we've all heard of royal families like the Habsburg the Romanovs not just to have famous political families like the Kennedys and the Bushes and the Roosevelts but to treat um the royal families of, say, Dahomey, Angola, Haiti, Hawaii, um, Ming and Tang, exactly as you would treat the House of Windsor or the Bourbons of France. And, um, and but also um, to use family to include um, other peoples, other places, to show how all of human history is really about hybridity, intermarriage, there are no pure families, no pure nations, and everyone is interconnected. And migration is really one of the great themes of the book. And I know I'm expanding slightly from Nina Simone there, but you know, everywhere I covered, I wanted to have a have a have, have a feeling that this was being freshly covered. And so, you know, when you look at the development of America, you know, slavery, Atlantic slavery, and the Jim Crow period are covered in great detail but so are the Comanches and the other indigenous people so are the the Incas um, and the Mexica and my resolution in all these places was not to have these people introduced when a, you know some Englishman turned up with it or a Spaniard with a galleon as they as they usually appear even in progressive history but to have have use family so that we already know the ruling family and we've met them hundreds of years before. And so, and so that this, this, let's say we can, we, we've expanded the remit of Nina Simone's amazing song about Mississippi and Alabama and the South and the civil rights struggle. Um, but I've applied that to the world, I hope. Got yeah, two more. Uh, this one is kind of going to be redundant because you talked about it earlier, but uh, you'll recognize it immediately. It's Marilyn Monroe. 
happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Happy birthday to you. Why'd you include that one? <laughs> that is, I mean, I, I mean, that is such, so wonderful to hear that, isn't it? It's just extraordinary. Well, this is such fun, Brian, I must say. But, you know, um, that is such an important song for so many reasons. I mean, I mean, let's just start with Marilyn Monroe herself. You know, she, you know, she um, personified in one character um, the really the kind of climax of American, the beginning of the sort of the, uh, the beginning of the complete world domination um, of American culture, particularly Hollywood movies. Um, and um, let me just turn this off. Um, here we go. Um, it, you know, this just this just personifies in that those words she personifies. You know, the climax of the world domination um, by Ameri of American culture, especially music, and above all by Hollywood. But at the same time, um, the dangers and desperations of of fame, of modern fame, particularly the new phenomenon of. Um, of, of, of sort of, of, of fame as victimhoods, particularly for female stars, particularly for women, and so that's one part of it. Um, she's a big character, so she's in she's in the book um, in her own right. But secondly, um, you know, she was she was she may have had a passing acquaintance of some sort with Frank Sinatra. Um, then she was, but he definitely introduced her to the Kennedys, and the Kennedys are a huge family in this book. I mean, there's a Kennedy running. Robert, Robert Kennedy Jr. is running now for the Democratic nomination. At the time that we're talking, he's got sometimes some polls put him at 20 percent, um, even though he's an anti-vaxxer and all sorts of other um, strange and I think wrong headed things. Um, but both his, his, his father and his uncle, Jack Kennedy, are big characters in the book. And the Kennedy presidency, again, is is one of those kind of highlights of the American century, um, Camelot, and yet also rather like Marilyn Monroe, it's nowadays we look back at it and we see the flaws of it too. We see um, the very personal leadership, the family, the, the, the rule by a family. You know, it, the Kennedys were once described as rather like a family of condottieri riding into a Italian, small Italian town during the Renaissance. Um, they ruled like a mafia family. They ruled like a dynasty. Uh, and um, his treatment of women was pretty appalling by, by modern standards, by our standards of the 21st century. And I, I quote some of those. I quote some of those women in the book. Um, on the other hand, you know, for all the faults of the Kennedy family and his father, Joe um, Senior was was a, was an appeaser of Hitler and, an, and a profound anti-Semite as well. But for all the faults of the family, Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy performed. When they were really called upon in the Cuba Missile Crisis, um, which I cover, this is a family history. You know, there were the Kennedy brothers were running Washington. There were the Castro brothers who were running uh, running Cuba. Anyway, but you know, during that crisis, they performed pretty well, I think, and they passed they passed the test. I don't know, I don't know many other presidents that would have performed as well as they did then. So, you know, this song. The affair of Ken the Kennedys with both Kennedys, with Marilyn Monroe, um, the presidency, the you know entertainment business, and the tragic character of Marilyn herself are all captured in that song. So that song is an absolutely essential song, and the actual occasion of her singing it is in the book, is in the world of family history, of course. You go back to what we were talking about earlier about you working to loud music. How loud do you make the music in that room? As loud as loud as I can, and you can't see. But I'm sitting here in a greenhouse. It's a sort of it's a former greenhouse converted into a study, and so there's gardens all around. Um, I'm in Kensington, London, and um, I'm very unpopular around here, Brian, because <laughs> you know I've sat in here for two and a half years playing very loud music and sort of just typing madly, and. It's part of my system. But you know, the real problem with this book was how to master so many different things. I mean, not only is it 
Um, it's a study of the Middle East, it's the study of Asia, it's a study of Africa, and I wanted Africa to play a bigger part in this than any other world history. But this all took a lot of studying, and I had to sort of master um, a lot of subjects. You know, I, I, of course, I knew Russia well. I know the Middle East and Jerusalem and Israel and the Arab world pretty well. Um, and I've written books on those before, but there were places that I didn't know well. Um, there was, there's, there's many aspects um, of the world that I didn't know well, medical advances, technical advances, um, slavery, which is covered very fully in the book, not just not just Atlantic slavery, um, which which is highly studied now by everybody, particularly in, in uh, America and Britain, but also East African, Trans-Saharan, um, and the Black Sea, what we call the sort of Black Sea um, slave trade. And all of these were huge slave trades involving tens of millions of people. Um, so all of that I had to master. And that was an extremely stressful process. So music helped a bit. Well, when do you find time to read? I read day and night to do this book because what I wanted, I wanted everything to be as up to date as possible. But if I had any genius in this book, it is knowing what you don't know. And rather than having lots of researchers, I didn't really have any research. I had, I had one that started, one wonderful person started for the first a month of the book. She went off and had a baby. So I lost her and then I didn't replace her and I did all the research myself. And instead of having researchers, because I felt that my eye, the things that I'm interested in are what are covered in the book. And all my books are written really because of what's interesting to me. Um, but instead of that, I wrote to the experts on every subject in the book, you know, whether they were at Harvard University or, you know, Oxford um, or, 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 or the Sorbonne. And I wrote to them and just said, listen, I'm writing this world, this world history and this rather strange project. Could you just read your sections and correct them for me? And obviously some of them just said, get lost. Um, some of them said, this, is, this book is, I, I can't understand what, because I never sent them the whole book, you see. First of all, it was too long and I was afraid it would put them off. But secondly, I was developing the idea of following these family histories interwoven. I didn't want anyone to know. So I only sent them their bits. So some of them just said, like, this is a this book is very odd. It's so it, it, it seems to be completely shattered and fragmented. I can't help you with this. And then other people said, I don't want my name in the book, but here are corrections. Um, and other people said, I'm, I'd love to help. Um, and they corrected everything. So so, of course, the mistakes in the book are mine. But much of the genius in here belongs to the greatest world experts. But how do you. I mean, that's time intensive to send all yes. those notes. I mean, I've seen your list in the front of the book. Everybody from Henry Kissinger to Annette Gordon Reed in this country. Uh, did you do you have a staff that helps you with all this? No, no, I did everything myself. And it did almost kill me writing it. I mean, I, I was quite sort of strained. I actually sort of wondered um, if I'd make it through this project. I mean, you know. Someone like Annette Gordon Reed was very decisive. I mean, she was very kind of her to, to help um, check. She checked the America, the US, United States of American sections. Um, but her book on Sally Hemming, the Hemings, uh, an American, the Hemings of Monticello, an American family, that was very decisive for me in, in, in formulating this idea of a family history, which is a new idea which no one's done before. But in some ways, she inspired it because she showed how. The families in the book don't have to be royal families. I mean, lots of them are kind of dictatorial families like the Kims of North Korea or the Assads, but lots of them are also enslaved people like the Hemings of Monticello or, um, or, or, or many professions. There are, there are families of doctors, families of civil servants, families of executioners, families of novelists and historians. And that's, that's also part of the fun of this book. It, it applies to everything. And so I did it. I did all that myself and I took in all their comments and I took in their terrible criticisms and and I and I made the changes to the book. And so a lot of a lot of very clever people have checked this book. I'm not saying everything, you know, I'm not saying it's perfect, but 
very lucky to have all those professors um, read it, and I'm very honored that they trusted me with their knowledge. This is a big book, and do you wait till you're finished before you give it to Kanaf, or did you give them to the as you went through the 22 different sections? No, I I knew this was an eccentric. Um, a new way of it. But this is a totally new way of approaching world history. And I knew that no one would believe it was possible until I'd done it. The whole point was it had to be completely interwoven. It had to switch from different parts of the world, from Baghdad to Washington to, to Beijing. In, on, in every section, it had to have the families interlinked and yet linked. Um, it couldn't be just a list of a, a series of Wikipedia like biography, you know, biography sections. So I knew that I had to finish it before I could show it to anybody. And um, so I didn't show it to anybody. And my method is I write all the way to the end of the book without stopping, without looking back and without rewriting anything. And then I literally sit with a huge heap of the manuscript with a red pen and I write on the manuscript and correct everything and rewrite everything. And I think I've put on, my publisher or somebody has put on um, on, on Twitter or on Instagram, you can see the pages and how I work on them. And and I rewrite everything. I'm, I must be every editor's total nightmare, but it does work. And I really sweat blood, one, to make sure that the book is original, two, to make sure it's it's in, scholar, in scholarship terms, it's, it's correct, as correct as it can be. And then I sweat blood trying to make sure that it's beautifully written, which is in some ways the hardest of all. One last song. Um, I have to admit, I've lived since this period started back in the early 1940s. And this is one of my all-time favorite songs. It's Vera Lynn, and I'll get your comment after we listen to it a little bit. meet again don't know where don't know when but I know we'll meet again some sunny day keep smiling through just like you always do Till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away. 1939, that was number 137 on your list. Who was Vera Lynn, and why does that sound like World War II? Well, it, it is World War II. It's the great song of World War II, which is why, of course, it's in the list. World War II is a massively important part of the book. Um there are challenges to, you know, what happened in, in World War II, to the to the veracity of the Holo- of the veracity of the Holocaust and so on. It's very important to have these uh, fascinating but also very important events properly um, told in the book. One often forgets too that you know in World War II there were 13 million slaves, enslaved people in Europe in Hitler's empire. And um, it was, of course, it was only lasted three or four years. Just worth remembering that. It's quite an interesting number. Just to show the, the colossal nature of the human tragedy of World War II. That, and that's, that's before you get to the number of Slavs and Russians who were starved and to death and killed and, and the Jews, the six million Jews and so on. But in England, um, 1940, the Blitz and early world, uh, early, the early 1940s, um, with the period when Vera Lynn's song, We'll Meet Again, really symbolized people going away to the war and, um, and wives saying goodbye to, to, their, to their loved ones. And it's a very moving song. My mother used to sing it. Incidentally, my mother, when I, when I was trying to work out how to write this book, The World, my mother said to me, Simon, give the money back. She said, give the money back. Far too stressful. But anyway... I, um, I, 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 as we know, I did write it in the end. But this song really symbolizes World War II, and it has a very interesting echo. When Queen Elizabeth II, uh, in our own time, in COVID, gave her speech at the height of lockdown, she echoed, we'll meet again. 
and um, and and she was a child of World War II, as, as you know. And so this song has a sort of double link to COVID, to Elizabeth II, but also to um, to to World War II. And I should say, Elizabeth II is an interesting character. I, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to meet her a couple of times, and um, she was she was a delightful person, and she's of course in the book. Um, so, so, you know, one of the fun things about this book, because it's written about the last 50, 40, 50 years as well, it goes up to the very day of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, it ends on that day. Um, I was able to put in a lot of the characters that I've met in my own life, and you, you, know, you mentioned Kissinger, checked the 1970s for example for fact we're very fortunate he's a i think he's a hundred this week um extraordinary character you know having henry kissinger uh correct and read your um sections on the 19 between 1969 and 76 it's a bit like having metternich correct the <laughs> the, uh, the sections on the napoleonic wars but also we've got shimon perez uh we've got shevin nadzi we've got boris berezovsky Quite a few people that I've met and talked to uh, are quoted in this book, and um, you know it's fun to hear it from the from the horse's mouth. And I was lucky enough as a war correspondent in the early nineties in Russia to see a lot of these events. And perhaps I should just say, I mean, it's it's a really great thing for a historian to witness, as I did in, in from nineteen ninety to nineteen ninety five, the fall of a great empire. Because you talked a little bit about your mother and your family. I saw you and Andrew Roberts, who has been on this program, talking about the fact, and he called you, uh, by the way, he was calling you Bag instead of Seabag or Simon. But he said that something to the effect that he's the godfather from somebody in your family and you're the godfather of somebody. Explain all that in your relationship with Yes, I mean, I mean, we... We British historians, a lot of us know each other, <laughs> and a lot of us are, are, are friendly. And Andrew Roberts is the godfather of my daughter, and I'm the my, my wife is the godfather, godmother of his daughter. So um, we've known each other. We were at Cambridge together, and he went on to write great books like Salisbury and Churchill, and um, I went on to follow a slightly different path. But of course, we know each other, and he interviewed me on his podcast, which I think is linked to Stanford, and. The Hoover, um, the Hoover Institution, yeah. The Hoover Institute. And I, I, but I do tease him because his, his latest biography, and biographies are getting longer and longer, especially American biographies, I should say, um, but especially L LBJ, the um, Robert Carey's LBJ, of course. But, um, but his, his biography of Winston Churchill, by the way, which I highly recommend, um, is only a little bit, it's, about, it's roughly the same length as this, about 1,200 pages, I think, or 1,100 pages. And um, I teased him because I said, you know, I've got everything you need to know about Winston Churchill in my book and all the other Churchills, I said, you know, and, and John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough. Um, and it's taken you the same length of time as I cover everything. So um, so we, we, we have a bit of a joke about that. But he's, he's an extremely good writer. Running out of time. We talked in 2004. I ask you, uh, were you personal friends of then the Prince of Wales? You said yes, and uh, now he's king. Do you have any relationship yes. with him and his queen? Yes, we we we're, we're very we're, we're we're very good friends, I think. And um, and you know it was great. I was very lucky to see him um, crowned, to see the coronation, to attend the coronation, which, as you can imagine. Um, I said it was a great, it was a fascinating and essential thing for a historian to see an empire being being demolished with the fall of the Soviet Union. But you can imagine for a historian to sit um, right there in, in the um, in in Westminster Abbey and see a king anointed and crowned is an extraordinary thing for any historian. And so I was fascinated to to see this. I mean, as a friend. I was proud and gratified. Um, as, an, as, as an Englishman, I was, I was also, um, you know, I, deeply, I was deeply proud of the British, the British constitution, the British democracy, idiosyncratic as it is, I should say to you, to you Americans, um, 
And also, you know, as a historian, I was just gripped. So on all sides, I was um, I was thrilled to be there. And yes, he is a good friend. And I do think, you know, again, yes, it's an idiosyncratic system where you have a democracy where part of the state is hereditary. And, you know, many Americans regard this as absurd. Um, but you see the advantage of it. Um, your presidency is very powerful. It's very hard to impeach your presidents, for example. And your presidents can be overpowerful. While in our system, um, it's rather easy to get rid of prime ministers. And you remember from the audiences that, um, that uh, Ther Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak had. Um, it was really a good example of, you know, when we get when we get it wrong, our system, you can get rid of them pretty quickly, A. And B, they go and have a, an audience with a figure, the sovereign, whether it was Elizabeth II or her admirable son, Charles III, my friend. Um, you go and have an audience with them and you see continuity and experience um, and duty there personified. So the British system, which is very similar to all the Northern European systems, by the way, you know, in, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, Scandinavia, and so on, Luxembourg, um, it's, it's, it's a strange one. Um, but these are democracies, and oddly, it works. Last question. Another book planned? Subject matter selected? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to write a lot of fiction now. I've written fiction before, and um, some of my favorite books are my my Moscow trilogy of novels, Sashanka, One Night in Winter, and so on. Um, so I'm going to do more fiction now, and I've got a whole lot of those planned. But my next big history book is going to be a children's version, illustrated version of Jerusalem. Simon Seabag, Montefiore, thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you, as always. Brian, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.